We're back out here once again, and today we're talking about some early fall baits that have absolutely been crushing it for me. Stick around, you don't want to miss this one. Ooh, there I got him. Oh, you ain't throwing that. Whoa. And here is this video's featured comment. Congratulations. If you would like to have a chance to have your comment featured in an upcoming video, all you've got to do is leave a comment. And now, on with the video. Welcome back to Lowbrow Fishing. And as the month of September rolls along, we as anglers begin to notice subtle changes in those bass, don't we? They break up from those large groups that they have offshore and they start moving back up shallow. Not all at once. Now, whether this is caused by water temperature, whether this is caused by sun position, you know, that's up for debate. Me, I'm more of a sun position guy because water temperature can change from year in and year out, yet bass behavior seems to be pretty much consistent. Every September, those bass start to move up, those schools start to break up, and we can start finding them in different places, feeding on different sorts of things, right? I mean, we can find them in the backs of pockets now. You're finding a bigger population of bass up shallow, and for the most part, you can see them busting along the shore. Now, what are they feeding on? Well, that depends upon the fishery that you are on. For me, on my fishery, it's shad, shiner, crawfish, bluegill, those sorts of things. And on your fishery, I'm betting it's something similar. Now, those are the types of things that we want to mimic. We want to be in line with that pattern. We don't want to be out there, you know, chucking and winding, burning a crankbait in empty water. So we need to follow those bass. And in order to follow the bass, we need to be following the food. So first and foremost, as we've talked about before, find where that bass is getting their food. Find what they're feeding on, locate life, locate the food, and you will locate the bass. And for me and for many other anglers I've talked to right now, those bass are moving back into pockets. They're moving more up into those creek arms, getting ready to feed up for the fall transition. You know, I said it before, the fall transition is a great time in the deep south to fish because we really don't have a turnover. You know, a lot of lakes up north, they'll have that fall turnover where the oxygenation flips, right? And it'll kill the bite. But here, we really don't have that on my lake because the water is usually pretty oxygenated as it is and it really doesn't develop a hard thermocline. So for the most part, we don't get that much of a turnover. We don't get a big flip where the water turns over. But still, for the most part, by that time, those bass are going to be in the backs of coves. They're going to be closer to shore. And if you're a bank angler, they're going to be that much more accessible. So what am I throwing? Well, we've talked about in past videos that I've been doing things like jerk baits, soft plastic jerk baits, and crank baits. But now my presentations are going to change just a little bit. They're going to get just a little bit more subtle. And in some instances, I'm going to downsize sometimes quite a bit, because I want to mimic what those bass are feeding on. If you've got large shad in your lake, or large shiner, or bluegill, then those are going to be the things that the bass are going to be feeding on. You kind of want to mimic the size of the thing that they're feeding on. You know, it's not rocket science, but in my lake, well, the shad are, are not really that big, and the shiners they're, they're not big yet either, so they stay kind of small still this time of year. It probably won't be until next spring or so that the shad and the shiners actually get some decent size to them, which is, you know, more for the pre-spawn, more for the spawn type of area. So what types of baits am I throwing and what types of conditions am I looking for to throw those baits? Well, let's go ahead and get into it because I've got a few presentations I'd like to show you. Now, before we get started today, I want to take a minute and bid farewell to an old friend, a dear friend of the channel. You all know them very well. You've seen them many, many times on this channel. And that is my old Silver Max Reel. You know, the old beat up, busted thing, the thing that you guys gave me grief about because it grinded like it had bad years in it. Well, it finally broke. The level wind system in it, the worm gear has totally failed 
and it won't crank. And you know, this is to be expected. It's the oldest active reel I had in my rotation and it was a real trooper. So we're gonna have just a moment of silence and view some of the accomplishments that that reel has done for me over the past few years. It, yeah, but one point. Got him. I got him. All right, it's a nice one. I got him. I got him. I got him. Oh, that feels pretty good, actually. Is that just a gunk or is that a fish? It's not moving. It's not fighting me. Is that a gunk? Oh, it's a fish. It's a nice fish. And here we have the Silver Max's replacement, right? Just a regular Max STX. I picked it up at Walmart. I think it was, I don't know, 55 bucks or something like that. Super cheap, but so far, I really like this thing. It's a lot more quiet than the old Silver Max, but I may go on eBay and track down a Silver Max because I really did like that reel. Anyway, this presentation here, you guys know I've been throwing a weightless fluke a lot. Well, this is actually a weighted fluke. I've got a quarter ounce bullet weight on here that I have unpegged, obviously, you know, for aught EWG. Strike King Caffeine Shad, one of my favorites. You guys know that. Now, why am I throwing a weighted version rather than the weightless that I was throwing? Well, first of all, I'm fishing just a little bit deeper water. I'm fishing the mouths of those creek arms out toward the main lake with this. And what I'm doing with this is, is I'm not dragging the bottom. I'm actually popping it. I'll give it a good pop and then let it go down. That weight will separate from that bait and it'll cause it to fall down a little bit faster, but not rocketing fast because the weight has separated. And I'm getting reaction strikes. This is the time of year when I really start doing that. It's a great presentation. Now, if I'm doing it up shallow, if I'm fishing closer to the bank, I will actually peg that weight at times because I want a real fast flicker in that shallower water to try to get a reaction bite, especially if it's heavy vegetation. If I'm fishing hydrilla, if I'm fishing close to the bank and there's a lot of hydrilla, a lot of times I will have this weight pegged and I will be popping it. I'm not going to be dragging it. I will be popping it, trying to elicit reaction strikes from those bass. And I'm telling you, I have had some great strikes and some great fish. I've caught three, four, five pound bass from the bank doing that, even from the boat, doing that with just a little fluke rig. So give it a try, especially if you can find a pocket in the back of a creek arm that's got some heavy vegetation. Look for a seam, look for an area that's got a clear area and just toss this in there, give it a few pops and then just let it sit and then just give it a couple more pops, try to get it to go up and down, and then just let it sit. And I'm telling you, those bass will destroy this. And you'd be surprised at the tanks that you can catch doing it. Now, next up, we have a little bit variation on a theme. You guys know that I fish a swim bait quite often. And well, this is what I'm fishing right now. Like I said, I'm fishing a little bit deeper water. Uh, today, I'm fishing about 20 feet, 15, 20 feet of water. And I've got a Scottsboro uh, three and a half inch swim bait on here on a three eighths head. So I could get it down to that depth and keep it down there. And I'm slow rolling this, giving it pauses so it can pendulum back down. I'm almost fishing this like a Demiki rig, right? I'm doing it exceptionally slowly. I'm making pretty bomb casts out there and I'm letting it fall. I'm watching my line. And when it gets very near the bottom, that's when I bring it back and I stop it, pause it every once in a while, let it fall back to the bottom. And I'm telling you what, if, if you can find a bait ball to bring this through, and I've hooked a couple of shad doing this, but if you can bring this through a bait ball and come out the other side, you know, those bass will think that one of them is trying to get away and they will be all over it and you will just get hammered. So a lot of times another bait, if you see bass busting up, this is a great bait to throw in that area. You're not even having to target 
the top, right? You don't even have to target the top of the water column. You're actually targeting the middle and the bottom of the water column. But because those bass are gathering those bait in two balls and they don't like any of them getting away, if you can mimic one trying to make a break for it, I'm telling you, you'll have two or three bass following it and then one smashing it. You'll be bringing it to the boat and you'll have a couple that are right there with it. And this is just my regular swim bait setup. You know, I've got a spinning combo. It's got like a six two to one gear ratio. We've got 12 pound fluorocarbon on my seven foot medium heavy, but it's got a moderate tip. And I like that softer tip because I'm doing side set hook sets. I'm not yanking it as hard as I can. I'm letting the fish take that bait as much as I can before leaning into it because I don't want to blow that fish's mouth open. So again, these are great. It's a great alternative to something like a jerk bait. And especially as the fall rolls on and those bait balls are getting tighter and tighter, something like this is a viable option, even for bank anchors. And I'm using these, which are great soft swim baits that you can find pretty much anywhere. And obviously you've got to have a few Kitex, the swing impacts, the four inch, and this is the sexy shad color. And I love this. Again, four inches, I'm downsizing that presentation because the bait in my lake is smaller right now, and that's what those bass are feeding on. Obviously, I've done the same thing with the Rage Swimmer. This is the 3.25 inch, and these are working well for me, all of these in the shad color, because that's what those bass are feeding on. Now, I'm getting a little sneaky with this next one because it's near and dear to my heart. It's what I love, and that's a football jig. Obviously, like I said, I'm still fishing a little bit deeper. I'm in the mouths of those creek arms. I'm fishing a little bit deeper water. And here I've got a football jig, and this is a homemade craw trailer, uh, just a brown craw trailer. And this is a 3 8 football jig, and it's a finesse football jig, you see? Like I talked about downsizing the presentation, and this is just a 3 8 finesse football jig. And this is the same heavy jig setup that I always use for all my jig setups, right? This is the same, you know, even though this is only a 3 8 I've got the 7.3 Heavy Power Rod. I've got my uh, Abu Garcia Revo X, and this is the 7.3 to 1 gear ratio, 50 pound braid to a 22 pound fluorocarbon leader. And, you know, that lets me just torque those fish in. And a lot of times, even though this is a smaller presentation, even though this is a smaller type of jig, you know, it's what's getting the job done and I'm catching some nice fish. Two pound, two and a half pound, three pound. So this is still working for those larger size fish. As is this little guy right here, a little three eighths finesse jig, which is the little, you know, homemade craw trailer on the back of it, just a little snack. Now this, I'm saving up for that more shallow water. On a clear day, on a slick, calm day, I'm gonna be throwing this guy around in those pockets of that vegetation right up near the bank in the backs of those creek arms and this guy is getting plugged. I fished him today up under the fishing dock which you know has been rendered inaccessible. They've boarded it off finally. That thing was a hazard but it's still great to fish under and this little guy did great work for me up underneath that fishing dock. You can make some skips up under there and that smaller presentation, even to bigger bass, this is a snack, this is a morsel that they just can't ignore. So a finesse jig, we're getting into that time where as the water cools off, sometimes those bass, they want a little bit smaller snack. And if you put this in front of their face, it doesn't matter if it's a dink, it doesn't matter if it's a dinosaur, they're not going to turn it down. Now I promised you a sneaky bait, a sneaky presentation, and lastly, that is exactly what we have, and that is, these little guys right here, right? Little cotton cordell super spots, but these are the one quarter ounce size. Again, downsizing that presentation just a bit as those fish are on the move. Now these have worked not only in the mouth of creek arms, but back toward the middle and toward the backs of those creeks. So, and these, you know, these have a good rattle to them, but they are small. And even on a pressured body of water, even if your body of water is still pressured, these are very tempting. That size alone is very unassuming. And just because these are smaller baits does not mean you're going to catch smaller fish. I have caught some giants on these little things and, you know, they still cast quite a ways. Again, as I've said before, I open these up straight out of the package and I'm using them straight out of the package. I'm not changing the hooks. I'm not changing the hardware. To me, that totally defeats the purpose. 
And you know, these work for sunny days. They work for clear, calmer days, you know, that matte finish. This one right here, this, this shad has got a little flash to it. So you may be able to get away with it if it's a little bit more cloudy. But if we're talking about something that's a lot more cloudy day where that sky's a lot more overcast, there's a lot of wind, that water's got very little visibility to it. Well, then I'm going to something like this. This is just a regular H2O Express, but this thing makes a loud rattle. It's got a really loud vibration as it goes under the water. Plus it's very visually striking. So it can be seen at a distance, even in that murky water. So if that water is, if it's got some haze to it, if it's got some silt to it, if that water has been kicked up by the wind and some boat traffic, you know, there's some silt to it. It's, it's got, you know, off colored water, or we've got really cloudy days and that sunlight is just not penetrating It's darker conditions, you know, something like this, even say early in the morning or in the evening time as that sun is beginning to set and you've got that dusk, dark or morning dawn area, you know, this can also be killer. But like I said, you know, you have to adjust your bait for the time, for the conditions. And that's why I always like to have several different types of presentations with me. And if you notice, they go from very subtle to very loud and ruckus. And that's how I like to do things. I start like a ninja first, right? As we've said before, start like a ninja, very stealthy, and then move forward from there. So there you have it. There's some proven baits and presentations that are sure to help you get not just more bites, but more quality bites as we transition from summer into fall. Thanks for watching Low Brow Fishing. We'll catch you in the next one.